Praise the Lord. Where I saw and pray to the Lord that the Lord will prepare our hearts for the Bible study tonight. Everybody rising up quickly. Talk to the Lord in prayer. And pray that today the Lord will reach out to your heart. Speak to you. And that your heart will receive the word of God. That the seriousness, the dedication, the devotion expected of real disciples of Christ. Wanting to learn, wanting to hear, wanting to know. I want you to obey the word of God that the Lord himself will give you such a heart that will receive the word of God. And you will not allow the word of God to fall to the ground. Every word, every statement, every verse that is read Every explanation, every application will touch your heart, touch your soul, and do something very definite in your life. Pray that the Lord will give you the heart of a disciple, the heart of a learner. That God will give you the grace to be doers of the word. So that the blessing of obedience will be upon your life. In Jesus' name we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you, Lord, because you brought us together for something great and something good. You reveal your mind, your word, your will to everyone here tonight. In Jesus' name. As you reveal yourself to Nebuchadnezzar, and then you reveal the deep interpretation of the word of the dream unto Daniel. Oh Lord, make yourself plain and clear, well known, even here tonight in Jesus' name. That the darkness in our hearts, the confusion in our minds, and all the things that are not tied or revealed that tonight, you dissolve all the doubts. You take all the confusion away. That your light will come and dispel every darkness away from us in Jesus' name. Shine the light to every heart. Show the way to everyone. Direct the path of every child of God in Jesus' name. Take our sorrows away. Take our confusion away. Take our weaknesses away. Make us strong by the teaching of the word of God. And Lord, we pray you prepare us for that coming glory. That Lord, this day, more grace will come to us. And then we'll prepare us in godliness for glory. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit down. I welcome you to the Bible study tonight. It's always a joy. To see so many people around on a Monday night like this. And for those who are joining us by satellite or internet or whatever, we welcome every one of you and we pray that this will be a memorable night for every one of us in Jesus' name. By the way, we're coming to Daniel and this is Daniel chapter 2. You've been hearing about dreams in the Bible. You've heard about the dream of Joseph. That was just a dream pertaining to one man. You have heard about the dreams of other people like Abimelech. And that was a dream pertaining to one man and his family. Here we come to the greatest dream that was ever recorded in the Old Testament. The greatest dream that God ever gave to a man. And that God that gave him also provided an interpreter that will recover the dream, that will give the interpretation of the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. It is a dream that concerned not only Nebuchadnezzar, not only Babylon, and not only the kingdoms of that time, but that will pertain to the kingdoms of the world until the coming of Christ. This dream sweeps across 
the centuries and the millennia, thousands of years from the time of Nebuchadnezzar until the time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, a very great dream, a significant dream that has a great meaning that no Christian should be ignorant of. We're coming back to Daniel chapter 2. I'm going to start from verse 1. The reason I'm doing that is to recap a little bit because of those, maybe you are not here the other time when we studied verses 1 to 18 and then verses 17 to 30. I want to just review a little bit for you to understand so that we can make a connection between what we're doing today and what we learned the other time. Chapter 2 verse 1, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams where we his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. He had a dream like he never had. He had a dream like no man ever had in the whole world. And then he forgot the dream. It broke his heart. It frightened him. It alarmed him. He didn't know the meaning of the dream. If you look at verse 5, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the sin is gone from me. I just know I had a dream, and I know it was an awesome dream, a frightful, a frightening dream, a kind of dream that makes you panic, that makes you tremble, but it's gone away from me. If ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be caught in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dung hill. Maybe you don't understand that. I was talking to the wise men of Babylon. He said, you have been trained to dissolve doubts. You have been trained to remove difficulties. You have been trained to solve problems. Now, here is the greatest problem I ever had. And now you must give me the solution to the problem. They said, okay, this is difficult. This is impossible. Nobody can do this. And then he said, if you don't do it, I'm going to punish you by death. Now you wonder why he became so serious. It was that kind of seriousness that made him eventually to be able to get the interpretation. Whenever you have a problem, if you don't care about the problem, nobody else will care. If you are not concerned about the problem, nobody else will be concerned. But it is when you care, when you are concerned, and you really passionately look for the solution, then you'll get the solution in verse 11. And it is a rare thing. That the king requires, and there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Those wise men told him, they said, king, this is rare. Nobody ever asked another person to recover or to rediscover the dream that he had lost. Nobody ever asked a man, because no man can reveal anything like this. Only those people that have the gods, the spirits of them, can do this. In verse 16, Then Daniel went in and de desired of the king that he would give him time, and that he would show the king the interpretation. Daniel was a prepared man. Daniel was a man that God had prepared to be able to solve problems. And so he went to the king and said, King, I'll show it to you. I'll go and pray. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. And then we have in verse 19, it says, Then was a secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. What the king was looking for. And what the magicians and the sorcerers and the wise men of Babylon could not reveal to the king. Now God revealed it unto Daniel. And then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. In verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king. He now went to the king. He wanted to tell the king, what you are looking for, I found it. The secrets that nobody else could tell you, I discovered it. What bothered you? And what shocked you? What alarmed you? You were looking for so you couldn't find. I have found it. He went into the king in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven. There is a God in heaven. 
Remember that when you have a problem that seems difficult, there is a God in heaven. Remember that when you're looking for something you have lost and nobody could recover it for you. Remember, there is a God in heaven. Remember in the days of confusion, in the days of trouble, in the days of trial, in the days of travail. When it appears that you have no friend who can help you. Remember, when everything seems impossible for man, there is a God in heaven. No more confusion. And no more darkness. And no more panic. No more fear. Because we have a God in heaven who is going to solve all our problems. In verse 28, but there is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. And maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. And then he went on to tell the king what he had forgotten to reveal what was covered up. The forgotten dream brought the unforgettable Daniel. I want to tell you that Babylon will never forget Daniel. In fact, the children of Israel will never forget Daniel. And then even the church today, as we study the book of Daniel, how can you forget Daniel? And what brought that man out was a problem. I want to tell you that problems produce prayer warriors. How would Daniel have preached? How would Daniel have showed the prophetic gift? It was a problem that raised up the man. Problems produce prophets. Persecu it's like persecution today. When you're persecuted, when you suffer, you, you think, what is all this? Well, you need to understand that it is that persecution. It is a problem that will strengthen you in the inner man. The problems will drive you to the Lord. And when the problems drive you to the Lord, you're able to have, you're able to become what you couldn't have been without the problem. We say it this way, suffering strengthens saints. Suffering strengthens saints. Just like problems produced, uh, produced prophets. And it was the problem of this man of Nebuchadnezzar that made Daniel to come out. And then God revealed unto him the great things concerning the future kingdoms to come. And you see, we were talking about this Daniel. And it says God already had endowed Daniel with knowledge, with wisdom, with understanding in all visions and dreams. But it was a dream and the dilemma of the king that revealed the prophetic gift. There was an uncommon revelation in that forgotten dream. And Daniel, by divine revelation, received the interpretation from God. I pray that when such a time comes to your life, God will talk to you. He will commune with your heart. And the things that other people are not able to discover, you will discover in Jesus' name. It reveals that he is the dream we're looking at today. reveals a number of things. Number one, the development of the kingdoms of the world. Number two, the decline of the kingdoms of the world. Number three, the deterioration of the kingdoms of the world. Number four, the decay of the kingdoms of the world. Number five, the displacement. One kingdom giving way to another kingdom. The displacement of the kingdoms of the world. Number six, the disintegration of the kingdoms of the world. And then number seven, the final destruction of all the kingdoms of the world. This dream reveals the successive kingdoms of the gentle world and their ultimate collapse, the dissolution of all earthly and man-made structures is inevitable. Anything that is built on man inevitably, finally will collapse, will perish. That's why a child of God will not put his heart, his mind, all his focus, all his attention on the things of this world. We're told in Psalm 62 verse 10, Psalm 62, we're looking at verse 10, the latter part of verse 10. It says, if riches increase, set not your hearts upon them. Nebuchadnezzar should have known. The kingdom that he had, the power that he had, the authority that he had, all those things eventually will be displaced and destroyed. 
Therefore, he shouldn't have set his heart on them. And the Lord is telling us the same thing in Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, we're reading from verses 10 and 11. Don't put your mind, your heart on the things of this world. They don't last. They'll eventually be destroyed. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with, great, with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burnt up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The inward thoughts of the people of the world is as if their houses will continue forever, as if their kingdoms will continue forever, as if their palaces will continue to all generations. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not, he is like the beast that perish. Their, uh, this, the way, this their way is their folly. Nebuchadnezzar, a king who was even referred to as a king of kings in Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. He should have known, but he had exalted thoughts about himself. And that kingdom eventually perished. We're looking at uh, Daniel chapter 2, verse 29. This is what he was thinking about before the revelation came to him in the dream. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee. What shall come to pass? He thought that his glory will be unending will be irreplaceable. But God revealed to him that whatever is built on men will eventually collapse. This dream of Daniel chapter 2 was to hide pride from the king of Babylon, from the wise men of Babylon, and from all the kings of the gentle world. The dream is for the encouragement of God's covenant people, for the encouragement of all believers in Christ from generation to generation. What we say is for the encouragement of God's people is to remind us that no matter how long or how strong sinners may be, and no matter how long they may rule and reign, Christ shall be the King eternally, forever and ever. I thought you'll say Amen. amen. Tonight we're looking at this study, and we divide the study. The study itself is the unmistakable interpretation of an uncommon revelation. The unmistakable re interpretation of an uncommon revelation. We divide the message to three parts. Number one, the dream and the description of Gentile kings. The dream and the description of Gentile kings. Number two, the decline and displacement of Gentile kingdoms. Those Gentile kingdoms, that is the kingdoms of the world, how they will decline and how they will be displaced. Number three, the disintegration and destruction of Gentile kingdoms. We'll come to number one. Number one, the dream. And the description of Gentile kings. Daniel chapter 2. What did he mean from verse 31? Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee. And the form thereof was terrible. In verse 32, this image's head was of fine gold. His breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his tides of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part iron and of clay. Thou sawest till that, till that his stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broke into pieces together and became like chaff of the summer threshing floor. And the wind carried them away that 
no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Verse 36, this is the dream. This is the dream. Uh, can you see how certain Daniel was? Because it was not Daniel that had a dream. It was King Nebuchadnezzar that had a dream. And King Nebuchadnezzar had forgotten. But you know that if you, if you had something and then you forget, if somebody brings it up, you remember, say, yes, that's it. Before Nebuchadnezzar even responded, Daniel said, the head of that image is gold. And the breast is of silver. And then it, it goes on and on until you get to the feet, iron and clay. And then Daniel said, O oh king, this is the dream. This is unmistakable. That's an assurance that he had that God had actually spoken to him. God revealed the secret thoughts in the king's heart. And his forgotten dream, he revealed everything to Daniel. Because if you look at the passage, you are going to find that word revealed so many times. He revealed deep and secret things. That's verse 22. He knows what is in darkness. That's verse 22. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets. That's verse 28. And then it says, of a truth it is, Nebuchadnezzar said, that your God is a revealer of secrets. The revealed dream is of eschatological significance, revealing what shall be in the latter days, what shall come to pass hereafter. As Daniel spoke about the dream, he said, O king, can I tell you what you saw? You saw a massive, imposing, terrifying statue in the form and shape of a man appearing before you in your dream. Instead of this image being made of one metal, it was an image made of several metals. And then Daniel began to recount and to tell all the various items, all the various, uh, all the, all the various metals that the image had. It was of decreasing, diminishing value. Gold, silver, brass, iron, and then clay. As the statue was viewed from the head to the feet, its value diminishes. Because, you see, you're going from gold to silver, from silver to brass, and from brass to iron, from iron to clay. The value diminishing. Its beauty decreases. Its glory declines. Its characteristics deteriorate. And its character degenerates. It is seemingly valuable at the top and clearly worthless and useless in its feet. It is telling you something. You know, the people of the world, they think that the kingdoms of the world, they think they're increasing. And they think they're increasing in wisdom. They're increasing in beauty. They're increasing in knowledge. But this revelation is showing us that man is not becoming better. And the kings of, king, kingdoms of the world are not becoming better. They're becoming worse. They're decreasing and diminishing in their value. And then Daniel said the form thereof was terrible was terrible. It was terrifying. It was awesome. It was frightening. This colossal human form, a top heavy statue of depreciating metal stood on weak feet of iron mixed with clay. All of man's glory will ultimately become worthless and will fade away. That's, that's the meaning of the thing. That, that's what God wanted Nebuchadnezzar to understand. And that is what he wants you and I to understand. That whatever it is people have in this world, it's not going to be becoming better and better. It's going to deteriorate. Look at First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, we're looking at verse 24. For all, the, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. All the glory of man, all the beauty of man, all the splendor of man is as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. That's talking about the glory of man failing and fading away. Now, as uh, Daniel interpreted this, Daniel made uh, him to know that he was the hedge of gold. 
Actually, Nebuchadnezzar should not have any problem with that interpretation. You should know that that is the truth. Isaiah chapter 14. You will see how Babylon was described. In Isaiah chapter 14, we're looking at verse 4. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 4. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How what? How as the oppressor sees, the golden city seized. Do you see the connection between Babylon and gold? They had much gold in Babylon. And it was like a gold was everywhere. They were very rich. And then God showed him that image and the head was gold. And the next kingdom that will come will not be as bright, will not be as rich, and will not have the same splendor that he had. That's why you'll find that the next thing that followed is such a silver. And then the kingdom that will follow after that, which will be following after the Middle Persian government, will also be less in value, will be of brass. And then the kingdom that will follow that, the Roman government, will be of iron and clay. That's what God was revealing to you. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar in Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. Reading from verse 7, for you to see the connection between the gold, the golden head, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. In Jeremiah chapter 51, reading from verse 7, verse 7, Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. There you are. Uh, so when Daniel said, thou art the head of gold, you see the interpretation of scriptural, it was based on scripture. Yes, inspired of God, given to him by God, but it was solidly based on the scriptures. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's sand that made all the earth drunken. The nations are drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Babylon is suddenly falling and destroyed. You see that? That's what Daniel was saying. Daniel was saying, the kingdom of Babylon will fall. It will be destroyed. It will be displaced by another kingdom. But Nebuchadnezzar did not know that until he was told, howl for her, take balm for her pain. If so be she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let her go and let us go everyone into some country. For her judgment reaches unto heaven and is lifted up even unto the skies. That's what God was revealing to Nebuchadnezzar. Judgment is coming. And the Lord was going to bring this judgment, devastation, destruction upon Babylon. The hedge of gold will give way to the breast of silver. In verse 10, the Lord has brought forth our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord our God. we we'll come back to Daniel now. In Daniel chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Because as Daniel described the dream, the image that the king saw, he must also tell him the interpretation thereof. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 38, And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowl of the heavens, of, of heaven as he given into thine hand and has made thee ruler over them all thou art this head of gold he told him he said you are the head of gold the first world emperor over a great empire the first world ruler over a great massive land over the whole world thou art the head of gold and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. You know what Daniel was saying? Daniel was saying, you will not reign forever. Are you referring to yourself as the king of kings? No. Are you referring to yourself as the ultimate, the final, the eternal one? The one that is there will never, never die. 
No, it cannot be. You are going to die. You are going to be destroyed. Your kingdom is going to be displaced because after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Oh, you say you are the most powerful and you're superior to everybody. Oh, yes, the inferior kingdom. Welcome. And that less valuable, the worthless one, the inferior one will come and even destroy your kingdom. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass which shall be a rule over all the earth. The same as you are ruling now, Nebuchadnezzar, another king will come, another kingdom will come and rule rule over that we're looking at um, we're looking at daniel chapter 10 daniel chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 20 then said he knowest thou wherefore i come unto thee now when i return to fight the prince of Persia, the middle persians those were the people that took over from babylon and then the middle persian people did not also retain it forever because we're told in verse 20 and when i am gone forth lo the prince of grecia shall come and here what daniel was revealing to uh, this man the cadnezer number one babylon number two the middle persian empire number three the grecian empire then number four, that is the kingdom of iron and clay. That is the Roman government. We're looking at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 1. Also I in the first year of the royals, the meat, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings of impartial. And the four shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And a mighty king shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. What we're learning here is that God was warning this man, Nebuchadnezzar, and was telling him, you are the head of gold, you are going to be destroyed. That is the dream. That is the description. Before I go to point number two, I need to ask a question. Did Nebuchadnezzar understand? Yes, I think he understood, because he now understood this was a dream. Did he follow up? Did he follow through? Did he obey? Did he submit himself? Did he humble himself after hearing that? The answer is no. He heard, and like many people that hear the truth of the word of God, he did not profit by what he heard. Why do we say that? Look at Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. What does that mean? You know when God showed that dream to Nebuchadnezzar, the image was of gold, of silver, of brass, of iron, of clay. And then he said, I can do something better. I can improve on that. And then he made an image totally of gold. He did not get the message. He wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to be exalted so high. And the message that Daniel gave him and said, you're going to be destroyed, you're going to be displaced, and you're going to get out of the scene. Another inferior kingdom will come and take over from you. He said, thank you, Daniel. That's the dream I had. I accept what you have said. I believe what you have said, but I'm going to go my own way. That's what some people do, that after they have got the revelation of the word of God, and the time they are hearing, they seem to accept, they seem to believe, but then they don't walk on it. And then we're told in verse 6, in verse 6, and whosoever falleth, falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning furry furnace. He said, well, Daniel, thank you very much for your interpretation. Thank you very much for recovering the dream that I lost. But I'm going to raise up an image. He raised up a golden image, all totally gold, from head to foot, to all the toes, everything golden. And he said, now that represents me. Already Daniel told me, I am the head of 
gold. I'm not just going to be the head of gold. I'm going to be the head and the breast and the hands and the thighs and the feet and the toes of gold. And he said, everybody, you fall down and worship. You know the story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Did they worship? They refused to worship. And then he cast them into the fire. And those people, were they burnt in this fire? No. He called them, they came out. After they came out, he said, Truly now I know there is a God in heaven. Was he converted? Was it changed? Just because he said, there is a God in heaven. You know, his pride was still there. You know, it's like many people, they study the Bible. They hear the interpretation. They even write, they even make some confession about what they have heard. And yet, there is no internal change. In what change? It is not just to hear. It's not just to listen. It's not just to know. It is to have that word turning us around, transforming us, and changing our lives. Look at him now in chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 30 and verse 31. The king spake and said, It's not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. You see that? He didn't learn a lesson. By the way, why did God give him the dream? And whenever God gave such a dream to people, whether in Bible days or in the days in which we live, why does God give the dream? Let's look at Job chapter 33. In Job chapter 33, I'm reading from verse 14. So, and why are we hearing the word of God? Why are we studying about this dream? Why are we studying about the interpretation of the dream? Here is the reason. Job 33 verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, in slumberings upon the bed, then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instruction. Here is the purpose, verse 17. Here is the reason, verse 17. Here is the reason why God gave him the dream, verse 17, that he may withdraw man from his purpose. That he may withdraw man from his purpose. The Lord knew his intention. He knew his heart. He knew his purpose. He knew what will happen in chapter 3. And he gave him that dream in chapter 2. And said, that purpose is not alright. You want to raise an image of gold unto yourself. All of gold. It is not right. He wanted to withdraw him from his purpose. And to hide pride from man. But he just went ahead in his purpose. He went ahead in his prize. I pray you'll not be like Nebuchadnezzar. That the word of God will have power and effect upon every one of us in Jesus' name. That whatever purposes you have, which are not according to the word of God. When you hear the word of God, that purpose, the word of God will knock it out of your heart. And when there is pride in your heart, the revelation of the word of God will take that pride away from your heart in Jesus' name. We come to point number two now. The decline and the displacement of Gentile kingdoms. The decline and the displacement of Gentile kingdoms. We're looking at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, we're reading from verse 36. After Daniel had told the dream, he now needed to give the interpretation. Verse 36, this is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. That's what you think about yourself. That's what your servants call you. That's what the Babylonians call you. That's how the people of the world, your subjects, that's how they refer to you, king of kings. And then it says, for the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom and power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and of the fowls of the heaven has he given into thy hand and has made thee ruler over them all. Thou art the 
his head of gold. In verse 39, after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall be a rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron uh, that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. So he gave him the uh, interpretation that is concerning the kingdoms of the world that will come. There will be one, Babylon. There will be two, Middle Persian. There will be three, the Greece, Grecians. And then there will be four, there will be the Romans. It says the revelation of the, of the dream came by inspiration. And Daniel had no doubt that there was no mistake in what he had related to the king. He said affirmatively, he said, this is the dream. Daniel also received the interpretation by inspiration. Daniel assured the king, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. We will tell, look at verse 36, this is the interpretation, and we will tell. We will tell. How many of them? I said how many of them? Four of them, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But you notice something here. Number one, Daniel was very humble. Very, he was lowly. He was honest. He said, I was not the only one that prayed. I was not the only one that recovered the dream. I was not the only one that, you know, did everything. And I was so great that God revealed this. No, I was not the only one. We will tell the interpretation before the king. And just the spokesman for the rest of us. Did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say anything? Did they say anything? There was no competition. They allowed Daniel to be their spokesman. What a lesson we learned. You know, when we're really converted, we're not struggling for position. We're not juggling for position. We're not fighting one another for position. We're not looking for a place for ourselves. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel said, the four of us, we will tell the king the interpretation. And they didn't have to share, okay, I will share part one, you will share part two, I will share part three, and he will share part four. No, they allowed Daniel to say everything, and they just kept quiet. You see, when you are born again, there will be the humility of a real child of God. When you are born again, there will be the lowliness of a real child of God. When you are born again, there will be the meekness of a real child of God. If you find yourself looking for publicity, if you find yourself looking for position, if you find yourself wanting to struggle with other people, no, you have done enough. I am going to take over now. I am going to do that. That's not an evidence of salvation. The evidence of salvation is lowliness and meekness and gentleness and humility and it is those people that god grants grace if i let me show you something at the end of the whole scene after daniel had revealed the dream look at chapter 2 now i'm reading from verse 46 then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. And the king answered unto Daniel and said, O oh, of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldest reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon. And the chief and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. You see what the king did? He promoted him. But I'm talking about the humility of Daniel. Look at the last verse. Then Daniel requested of the king. And he said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. You see that? Daniel said, you've given me all the gifts, all the promotion, all the recognition. As if I was the only one that received the revelation. How about my friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They also, they require some reward because we pray together. 
And that shows the real experience of the man. That shows the real heart of the man. When you have real experience of the Lord, when you have real mind of Christ, the real mind of Christ, that same humility will be there. You'll not want to take all the honor, all the glory, all the exaltation, all the reward. You'll think about other people. I don't want to do everything. He can do something. He can get involved. He should be rewarded too. Thank God for Daniel. I pray God will give us the same grace in Jesus' name. Daniel received the interpretation by revelation. Daniel assured the king that it wasn't just himself. We will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. But the use of the word we, the humility and the modesty of Daniel is clearly demonstrated. In his humility and modesty, he had said, The secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living but that thou mightest know the thought of thy heart. When the Lord endows us with any skill or gift, we must remain humble under the mighty hand of God before men. Now you see the interpretation that he gave to him. He said, the first one, you are the head of gold, the God of heaven, not the gods of Babylon. You see this Daniel is stretching out all the wrong thoughts and the wrong ideas and the proud feeling of Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar was thinking, my idol is so great, and my magic is so great, and my power is so great, and I have some great qualities by myself. Daniel said, no, it is the God of heaven. It is not your strength. It is not your wisdom. And it is not the God of Babylon that has given you the kingdom, the power, and the strength, and the glory. It is the God of heaven. The head of gold in the image represents the king and the kingdom of Babylon. The Babylonian kingdom was the first great empire with majestic despotism. The golden head representing the Babylonian government or kingdom, the wicked and cruel, was great and powerful. It was a great monarchy and worldwide empire ruling wheresoever the children of men dwell. And then Daniel said, there's going to be another kingdom after you. Following the head of gold, the image has the breast and the arms of silver representing the kingdom which will conquer and displace the Babylonian kingdom. And we all know that when Daniel made that uh, interpretation of the reading of the writing on the wall uh, for Belshazzar, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, he said the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes. Let's look at chapter 5, Daniel chapter 5. Reading from verse 25. This is the writing that was written. Many, many take a you for sin. This is the interpretation of the thing. Many, God has numbered the kingdom and finished it. And take a thou art weighed in the balances and have found wanting. Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Two arms of silver. The Medians and the, the Medes and the Persians. And you see, those were the people that defeated the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And so that's the kingdom that took over the Middle Persian government that took over from Babylon. After the reign of Nebuchadnezzar and his son, the kingdom was divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. As silver is inferior to gold, the Middle Persian Empire was inferior to the Babylonian a kingdom in glory, in power, in splendor. And then it goes on. If you look at chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 39. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass. Babylonian government, Babylonian kingdom, number one. Middle Persian government, Middle Persian kingdom, number two. And now the next one, the Grecian government or kingdom, that will be number three. This is referring to the Grecian empire, whose king was Alexander the Great. Greece followed Middle Persia as a world empire. We've read that already, but because it's, it may be new to you, let's read that again. That after the Middle Persians, then you have Greece. That's in Daniel chapter 10, verse 20. 
Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. This Alexander the Great was the emperor of the Grecian Empire. He insisted that he should be called the king of all the world. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. Let's look at verse 14 now of Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2, we're looking at verse 14. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. Referring to the Roman Empire which subdued the Grecian Empire, this was the last great monarchy to oppress the world. This fourth kingdom, the Roman government or the Roman kingdom, was the last, was the last. It was to last not only until Christ was coming, but until the time of the Antichrist, till the, till the second coming of Christ, the stone will smite and smash the feet of iron and the whole image. And let's look at it from verse 41. Whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of porter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be a need of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with merry clay, and as the toes of the feet are part of iron and part of clay, so that so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken, partly weak. And whereas thou sawest the iron mix were clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. What kingdom is that? The kingdom of Christ. That is, the kingdom of Babylon that's gone, and the kingdom of the Middle Persians that's gone, and the kingdom of the Grecians that's gone, and the kingdom of the Romans also will be destroyed. But the kingdom of Jesus will never be destroyed. In verse 44, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to all the people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all this kingdom, and it shall stand how long? Forever. I'm going to ask you a question now. Suppose you are in the position to interpret the word of God to a man like Nebuchadnezzar. Who wants to be so exalted? He doesn't want a rival. He doesn't want anybody to take over. And he has great power. And if you said whatever he didn't like, he could throw you into the fire. And you are then called to come and tell him his dream and interpretation. What kind of boldness will you have? What kind of courage will you have to be able to look at him face to face and to be able to say, Thou art the hedge of gold. And that another kingdom will come that will displace you. You will be destroyed. Another one will come, will be destroyed. Another one will come, will be destroyed. Then there will be a final one. And then, my Lord, my God, my Christ, my Savior, my Redeemer, Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, He will come and replace you all. And the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God and of His Lord. And He shall reign forever and ever. Would you be able able to have such boldness, such courage to declare the truth of God. That's the kind of thing we're learning from Daniel. He was a courageous man. And we need to learn this from Daniel. Number one, those of us who are preachers, 
Those of us who are declaring the word of God, we come before our congregation. And there are some people there that may be new. There are some people there that may not want us to mention this or mention that or mention that. There are some people there that may squeeze or frown or, or have an angry look against us. How will you be able to stand? That's what we're learning from Daniel. What do we learn? Number one, we learn from Daniel, Daniel's faithfulness. Daniel's faithfulness. We're looking at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 verse 21. And he changes times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that no understanding. He stood before Nebuchadnezzar and said, Nebuchadnezzar, there is a God in heaven. He removes kings and soon you are going to be removed. He was faithful. That was the truth. And he told the truth without fear, without favor. Number one thing the Lord wants us to learn from Daniel. We who are preaching, we must have Daniel's faithfulness. Number two, he had forgetfulness of himself. Forgetfulness of himself. When you rise up to preach, when you rise up to declare the word of God, when you rise up to give a testimony, when you go before people to win souls or to talk to them about Christ, if you are conscious of yourself, if you are conscious of what they think about you, if you are conscious of uh, the kind of uh, the kind of name they will give you after your message and after your declaration, after your proclamation, you're not going to be faithful to God. Number two, you will have Daniel's forgetfulness of self. We're looking at Vastachi. In Vastachi, but as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Number one is faithfulness. Number two is forgetfulness. Number three is forthrightness. It was forthright. He said it the way he ought to say it. He didn't cover it up. He didn't mellow it down. He didn't adjust it. He didn't modify it. Forthrightness. If we are going to be used of God, if we are going to declare the mind of God, we must be forthright and say what needs be said. And we don't take, we don't call sin by a beautiful name, by, we don't call sin by another name that will not be offensive to people. Be forthright and declare the word of God. We're looking at verse 38. In verse 38, it says, And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of heaven, as seek giving into thine hand, and has made thee ruler over them all, Thou art this head of gold. It was like Nathan talking to David. Thou art the man. He said, you are the head of gold. But you know gold does not go on forever. You know, in that image, you are going to be replaced. Forthrightness, you tell the truth. And you tell that truth in a forthright way, straightforward manner. And you're not, you're not a confused preacher. And you're not confusing people. You're not a cowardly preacher. You're a courageous preacher declaring the truth unto the people. Number four, the fearlessness of Daniel. Daniel's fearlessness. Number one is faithfulness. Number two is forgetfulness, forgetting himself. Number three is forthrightness. Number four is fearlessness. Look at verse 39. And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Nebuchadnezzar, I know you don't want to hear this. I know that this is not what you want to hear. You want to continue forever. But I'm here to tell you there's going to be another person that is going to replace you and displace you and destroy the kingdom of Babylon, the fearlessness. That's what the Lord has told us. If you're going to be a real preacher of the truth, you don't look at the faces of the people. You're not afraid of the people. Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm reading Jeremiah chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 7. When the Lord calls us to declare His mind, His will, His word of salvation, the way of salvation to people, you declare it without fear, without favor. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, 
Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. Whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. And says the Lord, you will not be afraid. I said you will not be afraid. You know, if you're afraid, you, you, you'll compromise. The fearful person will not be able to preach sound doctrine. The fearful person will not be able to knock sin on the head. The fearful person will be timid on the inside. He will be considering himself, if I said that, how will they respond? If I said that, how will they react to me? Fear not, the Lord Jesus Christ had said. We're looking at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 4. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that has no more than they can do. But I will forewarn you, whom ye shall fear, fear him which, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Number five is far sightedness. Far sightedness. You see, the message of Daniel, it was not just about today about tomorrow the message of daniel was not just about next week it was about the eternal future it's so far into the future if you're going to help people talk about eternity talk about heaven Talk about that everlasting life and look far into the future. Don't just be bogged down. Don't just be focused on the mundane things of this life. The future is there. Look at Daniel now, chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 44. Daniel chapter 2. We're looking at verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the king of heaven, the God of heaven, set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to all the people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand for how long? forever far-sighted and so then the lord is telling us you're a preacher of the gospel the lord has raised you up to be a preacher and to be a pastor what are you to do in your message be faithful be forgetful of yourself don't think about what will they say about me what will they think about me how will they react to me will they help me will they give me gifts will they appreciate me will they praise me forget yourself and declare the truth of the word of god number three be forthright say it the way it ought to be said that sinners will be convicted and saints will get on their knees and be committed consecrated unto the lord number four be fearless and then number five before you are going to be far-sighted number six faultlessness daniel's faultlessness faultlessness we're looking at uh, chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 45 in verse 45 the latter part of verse 45 this is certain and the interpretation thereof sure he said you'll not find fault with this interpretation you'll not find anything wrong with this interpretation you will not find any error in this interpretation the faultlessness of daniel in his life it was faultless in his message he was faultless i'm very sure he said this dream is certain and the interpretation is sure you know the righteous are bold as a lion if there's no skeleton in your cupboard if there's no private sin if there's no secret sin if there's no private fault error or sin you, you'll then be bold and be able to declare the word of god daniel chapter 6 i'm reading from verse 4 daniel chapter 6 verse 4 it says in verse 4, then the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could not find, they could find none occasion, nor fault. Find none occasion, nor fault, for as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found in him. What was true of his life was true of his message. No fault in the message. No error in the message. Number one, Daniel's faithfulness. 
Number two, Daniel's forgetfulness. He forgot himself and he gave himself completely to declare the mind of God. Number three, Daniel's forthrightness. Number four, Daniel, Daniel's fa- fearlessness. Number five, Daniel farsightedness. Number six, Daniel faultlessness. Number seven, Daniel's forcefulness. Daniel's forcefulness. Uh, the word was forceful, not because he shouted. The word was effective. The word was powerful. The word was pungent. And the word caught Nebuchadnezzar. The force of the word got him from his throne and got him knocking the ground with his head. Look at Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. I'm reading there from verse 46. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. When he had the word, he got up from his throne. He fell on the ground before Daniel. The word was powerful. The word was pungent. And the word was forceful. Tells us in verse verse 47, the, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of lords and the revealer of secrets. Seeing thou couldest reveal this secret, Job chapter 6. In Job chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 25. How forcible, how forceful are right words. How forcible, how forceful are right words. And you know that's what should happen when a sinner comes into the congregation and we're preaching. When a backslider comes into the meeting and we're preaching. When believers come into the meeting and we're preaching. The word of God should strike them at their heart and make them to fall down before the Lord. The word should be forceful. The forcefulness of Daniel. We're looking at First Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14 verse 24 verse 25. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, and one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, those are the secrets of his heart made manifest. That's what the word of Daniel did to Nebuchadnezzar. The secrets of his heart, the forgotten dream, and the uncommon interpretation came in, came to him through Daniel. And he says, those are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face. That's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did when he had that. Falling down on his face, he worshipped God and report that God is in you of a truth. And that's the testimony that Nebuchadnezzar had about Daniel. He said of a truth it is that your God is the revealer of secrets. We come now to point number three. Point number three, we're looking at uh, the disintegration and destruction of Gentile kingdoms. The disintegration and the destruction of Gentile kingdoms. Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, we're looking at verse 34. Daniel chapter 2. Looking at verse 34. Thou sawest till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now it's going to also interpret that what he has said now that stone came cut out of a mountain and without the agency of man, without human agency and struck at everything and then everything became chaff and was blown away by the wind. Here is the interpretation verse 44. And in the days of this king shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to all the people but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand and it shall stand 
forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God of heaven has made known to Nebuchadnezzar the king what shall come to pass here after. And this is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. And you see what uh, Daniel was saying. The stone is referring to Christ. Christ was born during the reign of Augustus Caesar of the Iron Kingdom, the Roman Empire. Daniel got it. And the Roman people were the people reigning at the time that the Christ Jesus was born. Do you know, in the time of the New Testament, it was the Roman government that was there at that time. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 28. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 28. And you're going to discover that it was uh, the, the Roman government that was there at that time. We're looking at verse 17. In verse 17, and it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people and or the customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. The Romans were the people ruling then. I, they were the people that were, were calling the iron and the clay. That she is, uh, uh, that's the time Christ was born. That's when he had his ministry and then that's when he was also crucified. Christ's birth and Christ's resurrection were without any human agency. That is without hands. Without man, without the help of man, Christ came. Christ died and then he rose again. The stone is of supernatural origin. His second coming and the establishment of his millennial kingdom on earth will also be without human agency. At one blow, the stone will demolish the image. And its broken pieces will be blown away. This mighting of the image is not a gradual process. It's a sudden action of judgment. When Christ came the first time, he did not smite the Roman government. He came to save. That's what he said. At the time he come, at the time he came the first time, he came to save. He did not come to judge. He did not come to condemn. It is when he comes the second time. That's when the action of the stone that will smite that image, that's when that action will be fulfilled at that time. In John, Gospel according to St. John, verse 3, verses 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. When he came the first time, he came to sacrifice. He came to save. He came to shed his blood. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. At that time when he came, he came to save. But that's not the end. He'll be coming back again. I said he's coming back again. When he comes back again, that's when he will judge. That's when he will act like that stone's smiting that image and destroying everything. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. He has committed all judgment unto the Son is coming again, and when He comes again, He will judge this world. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Acts, chapter 17. He'll come, He'll come again, and then He'll bring judgment upon the world. When He came the first time, that was not the time to smite the image. It was the time to save the world. It was the time to shed His blood, so that whosoever believeth in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. But when he comes again, the people of the world who have rejected and the kings of the world who have rejected, they will be smitten and the judgment will come upon them. Acts 17 verse 30 and verse 31. And the times of this ignorance got winged out, but commandeth all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in the which he will 
judge the world. That's still future. In the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained, whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead. You will see that many details of this prophetic dream already have been fulfilled. Babylon is gone. The head of gold is gone. Then you understand that the silver, that's gone. The, Babil- the Middle Persian government, that's gone. And then, you know, the brass, that is the, uh, the kingdom of the Grecians, that is gone. But now it remains another part. The final blow, the final destruction, and the final displacement, and the final establishment of the kingdom of Christ, when it shall reign and reign forever, that is still to come. I believe that at that time when it comes to reign, you will be there, I will be there. And we shall reign with the Lord in Jesus' name. Revelation chapter 17 verse 14. Revelation chapter 17. We're looking at verse 14. And these shall make war with the Lamb. That is all these kingdoms we're talking about. And when Christ comes, they try to fight. Because they already know from prophecy. And they know from the interpretation of this dream that when Christ comes, he's going to smite them. Therefore, they will put force and opposition. They will make war with the Lamb. But, and the Lamb shall overcome them. I said the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that be, they that are with him. Who are those people? We are the people. They are called and chosen and faithful. Revelation chapter 19 verse 11. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire. And his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with, with it, it, it should it should smite the nations you see that what they are smite it should smite the nations, and he shall rule then with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God, and he has on his vesture and on his tie in name written read it with me king of kings and lord of lords that's jesus christ is coming again those kings of the world they are his enemies he'll fight them and destroy them we are the servants of christ we are the children of god we are the followers of christ we will be with him will reign with him forever and ever when that stone smites that image and they are all destroyed, we in glorified bodies will be with the Lord Jesus Christ ever to be with our Lord. To be with Him, we must be born again. If you are born again, I rejoice with you. We'll be with Christ. You'll be there, I'll be there. And a joy shall never end in Jesus' name. We rise up and talk to the Lord that the Lord will keep us faithful. And the Lord will keep us with Him. That will never go away from the Lord. We're waiting for that coming glory. That blessed glory. What the Lord will do. We're waiting for Him. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. All that we have learned today. Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar. Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar. That heard everything and learned everything. And then in the following chapter. He still went ahead. And then he made an image of gold and said they shall worship that image of God. Don't be like that. Hear the word of God and yield to the word of God and surrender to the word of God. Let the word of God you have heard hide your purpose from you. Your former purpose, a wrong purpose, a sinful purpose. All the things you had in mind before. Cancel that and bury that and come in submission to the king of kings and to the lord of laws and then let it hide pride from you. Let you hide pride from you. That's how the word of God, the study of the word, that's how it will profit you. That the word will hide our purposes from us, will hide pride away from us. And then you surrender to the Lord.
So that when the Lord comes, He will not fight against you because you are not fighting against the Lord. You say, the Lord, I yield myself to you. Lord, I surrender myself to you. Lord, I consecrate myself to your body, soul, and spirit. I give myself completely, completely, completely unto you. That's how the word of God will profit us, will benefit us. The kingdoms of the world will perish. No matter how powerful they are, no matter how mighty they are, no matter how rich they are, of gold, of silver, of brass, of iron, they will perish. But only those who lean upon the Lord, only those who stay with the Lord, will live forever and ever and reign forever and ever with Him. You remember, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. And those who are not gathering together with me are scattering abroad. Be a follower of Christ, not an enemy. Be a disciple of Christ, not a denier, not somebody denying Christ, opposing Christ, fighting against Christ. The sinful world will be judged on the final day. Of their kings and priests and princes and all the people, that stone will smite them in judgment. Come out from among them, be a child of God. Come out from among them, be a saved soul. Turn away from your sin. Turn away from your evil. Be washed and cleansed with the blood of Jesus, the cleansing, the cleansing blood of the Lamb. Surrender to Christ. Follow after Christ. Live for Christ. Live for His glory. Yield yourself to His word, His way, and His will. Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar. He heard. He knew it was the truth. He even said so. He said, Daniel, now I can tell. Your God is a revealer of secrets. But the word he had did not profit him. His will was not broken. His pride was not taken away. His heart was still haughty. He waited until judgment came. You are not like that. Give yourself to him. Surrender yourself to him. A part of the people of God. Not his enemies. Not those who fight against him. And you have seen Daniel. You have seen how Daniel declared the word of God. To that haughty king. Faithful Daniel. Faithful Daniel. Be faithful when you declare the word. None of your hearers will be as wicked as Nebuchadnezzar. No member of your congregation will be as fierce, as cruel, as wicked. As dangerous, as diabolical, as Nebuchadnezzar. If Daniel could be faithful, you ought to be faithful. 
faithfully declaring the mind of God, the word of God, unto whosoever it may be. Maybe they are the people that want to reign on earth forever. Like Nebuchadnezzar. They want to be there and there and there and there forever. But Daniel was faithful. He said, Nebuchadnezzar, you will not be there forever. There's a God in heaven. He changes times and replaces and removes kings. Be faithful. Forget yourself. Forget yourself. Don't be so self-conscious. Forget self. Be faithful to God. Don't please yourself. Please God. It's not so too conscious of themselves. That are watching the people before they preach. That the people who cannot say the right thing at the right time to the people before them. They are afraid. They want to have some honor, some appreciation, some praise of men. Forget yourself. And declare the truth as it is. Be like Daniel be forthright. Look straight at your congregation. At the person you are witnessing to. Be forthright. Thou art the man. Tell them. Don't let them escape the edge of the sword of the spirit. He was fearless. He was fearless. Do you remember when he spoke to Belshazzar? Said, Thou art weighed and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided. Turned to the Medes, Medes and the Persians. Fearless. Fearlessly declaring the word of God, the gospel. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and then to the Greek. Be far-sighted. Look far into the future. Talk about eternity. Talk about heaven. Talk about hell. Talk about Christ's eternal kingdom. Not just about prosperity, that's just for now. Not just about money, that's just for now. Not just about the mundane things of this world, that's just for now. Be far-sighted. Look beyond the things of this world. Talk about the coming of Christ. Readiness for that coming. Preparation for that coming. And be faultless. Faultless in your life. And faultless in your message. No fault in your life. No fault in the message. No error in your life. No error in the message. Declare the pure truth of the gospel. Don't add, don't subtract. Be forceful. Be forceful. The word of Daniel had effect on Nebuchadnezzar, at least for that moment, got up from the throne, fell on the ground. Made a confession of a true Daniel. Your God is a God who reveals secrets. Don't let your message be so light. Your attitude so light. Your gesticulation so light, funny, frivolous. 
Bewitchy. Speak the word. The word of life eternal. And bring people on their knees. That they'll call upon the Lord. And say be merciful unto me. O God is sinner. It's when you surrender your heart, your will, your mind, everything to the Lord. That's when you stand steadfastly in the will of God. And you'll not be afraid of what men say. How men view you. What men think of you. Your mind will be to be faithful to God. The things of this world don't last. Don't set your mind on them. Riches, wealth, thrones, kingdoms, honor, position, power, possession. They don't last. Eventually they'll be destroyed. Where will you be at that time? When the world is on fire. When the things of the world melt away. Where will you be? The wise. Prepare to meet the Lord your God. Make sure you have the witness of the spirit of God in you. That you are truly born again. For except a man be born again. He cannot see. And he cannot enter. The kingdom of God. Be sure you have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Let your heart, your life be saturated with the word of God. And follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And keep on doing the will of God, the word of God. Keep on in the work of God. Occupy till I come. Don't let your love wax old. Don't be one of the foolish virgins. Be a wise virgin. Waiting for the Lord. Getting ready for the coming of the Lord. Prepared. When the Lord shall come. And watch and pray. Watch and pray. Don't be caught. In the spirit of this world. Finally. Let this word have a definite, lasting, enduring influence upon your heart. Don't let the effect be as the morning dew that vanishes away. Don't be like Nebuchadnezzar. Be like Daniel. Be humble as Daniel was humble. Holy, as Daniel was holy, meek, as Daniel was meek. You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the study? They didn't struggle for position, for publicity. Don't struggle for anything on this earth. Follow the Lord in all humility of heart and live. Whatever he gives, whatever he takes away, leave that in his hand. Be faithful until the very end. To those who overcome, the Lord will give a crown of life.